there was an alleged Russian spy who resided not too far from Ray's Hellberger. In fact, he resided there when the U.S. president and the Russian president were there eating burgers. Who knew? Arlington has had a history of spies and espionage from the Cold War to World War II and beyond. And we are really fortunate this evening to have Dr. David Robarge here to discuss this further. Now, I will tell you, I am pretty good at the internet machine, and I'm pretty good at the Google machine. But trying to find background on Dr. Robarge was a little bit tricky. <laughs> I wonder why. So, this is what I was able to find. Dr. Robarge is the chief historian of the CIA. He has been with the agency's history staff since 1996. So he knows a lot. A lot he may not share with you tonight. He worked at the CIA Counterterrorism Center and Directorate of Intelligence on the Palestinian and Iraq accounts. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Robarge. Thank you very much, Kim and uh, John Richardson, for inviting me to the event and for the officials of the Committee of 100 for making this uh, venue available for me and for all of you for, for turning out. Uh, I was kidding with Kim earlier that I was wearing some light disguise tonight and I actually look a lot like Tom Cruise, but I'm not, I'm not tearing off the beard and the uh, egghead shell on my, uh, on my dome. Uh, you'll have to just take me as I am. What I'm going to tell you tonight uh, are three interrelated stories that cover uh, over a half a century of time and are interconnected by more than the fact that most of them took place in Arlington, either in whole or in part. But I, I want to leave you with a particular theme that I think is one that uh, everybody should consider, which is the fact that these events have been able to occur in the United States for so many years. That is, counterintelligence attack against the United States is a pervasive problem and one that persists to this day. And though these are, I hope, entertaining stories and interesting because all of you are Arlington residents, nonetheless, there's really an underlying theme to what I'm saying, which is we need to be, I think, more security conscious uh, than we really are. And there is somehow built into American culture a tendency to kind of sway back and forth between complacency and over-concern. And we need to sort of search for that middle ground. And we'll see that in action uh, in these three stories that I'm going to talk to you about uh, tonight. The first one deals with an amazing accomplishment in cryptology, which is the breaking of codes and ciphers that our adversaries use to conceal their messages from us. This occurred during World War II at this location here, just off of Route 50, called Arlington Hall which currently is the location of the George Schultz Foreign Service Institute and the National Foreign Affairs Training Center. But over on the western part of it is a structure called Arlington Hall, which used to be the Arlington Junior College for Women, founded in the late 19th century, and then it ran into hard times and became a nonprofit organization during the 1930s. And then when some officers in the U.S. Army were looking around for a facility to house their signals intelligence organization, that is the organization that listened in to adversaries' communications, and if they happened to have been encrypted, would work on trying to break those codes and ciphers, they came upon Arlington Hall and said, this is a perfect location for us because we're outgrowing our current digs downtown at the munitions building. So, under the War Powers Act, they took it over. Uh, they also paid $630,000 for it, so it doesn't sound quite so authoritarian. And this quickly was converted into the place in which a lot of the most important cryptologic work was done during World War II. The mainstay location was the, the old administration building here. And you will see, as I'm paging through this, some other shots of it during the war and a little bit after. Uh, as the Army signals 
agency, as it was called, ASA, moved there. It eventually outgrew the location. It used this postcard image to recruit applicants for the organization. And eventually they built two rather atrocious looking temporary buildings. I don't think temporary and atrocious is uh, anything but redundant. Uh, any of you who were around here uh, after World War II and for some years thereafter remember the temporary buildings on the mall and mercifully were finally removed, at least don't look much better. Eventually, 3,600 members of the Army Security Agency were housed here and worked on some very important cryptologic work. Their principal preoccupation for a number of years was trying to break the Japanese diplomatic and military codes. And eventually, in conjunction with some very clever counterparts in the Navy, we were able to do so. That's the Pacific story, which I'm not getting into, because the one I want to tell you about is related more to the work they did on something that was exceptionally important during the early Cold War. This is the shoulder patch for the Army Signals Agency, Army Security Agency, as you can see, uh, the Eagle's Talon grabbing the signal symbolized by lightning here. And this is um, a group of the employees back in the 1940s reporting for work, and this is the kind of place in which they conducted their work, which I'll describe for you in a little bit. Uh, this is very typical of wartime facilities in the Washington area. They were overcrowded, pretty bleak. Working conditions, but people were there for the cause. As Arlington Hall moved through its history, it also became the headquarters of the National Security Agency, which was its successor in 1952. Later on, the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command, currently known as INSCOM, had facilities there, as did the Defense Intelligence Agency. And this is a photograph of it in the 1970s. Well, what were all these people doing there? for this period of time. They were working on a project codenamed Venona, which is one of the most amazing intelligence achievements in history, I would suggest. What you're dealing here with is Soviet intelligence communications going back and forth between the United States and Moscow. And we're talking about not just intelligence per se, the KGB and the military side, but we're also dealing with other organizations that were essentially fronts for intelligence activity, like trade associations, diplomatic representations. This had been going on ever since diplomatic relations were restored in 1933. No sooner did the Soviets have a reestablished diplomatic presence here than they were spying on us. And this is throughout World War II when they are punitively our allies. In effect, what we have here at Arlington Hall is the counterpart to the probably better known British effort at Bletchley Park that helped crack the German Enigma machine codes, the project codenamed Ultra. This is the Nona. It's targeting against the Soviets. Well, the Soviets are allies when this started in 1943, but two people didn't particularly care. One of them was Bill Donovan, who was running the Office of Strategic Services, the head of the predecessor to CIA, and he said, eventually we're going to get into war with these people. Let's start using our field operatives to watch out for them. So he's running that show. Back here, you have a colonel named Carter Clark, who is head of the Army Security Agency. And he says, we know what's going to happen after the war. Let's start finding out what these characters are up to. So he, violating, in effect, presidential mandates to not spy on the Soviets, goes ahead and tries to crack their codes. And he organizes the Venona Project. And the result of it is some amazing accomplishments in cryptology. Now, why was this such a tough target? The Soviets have historically, and the Russians also, have always been tough cryptologic targets to break. Very sophisticated systems that took a lot of manpower and brain power, and actually a lot of woman power too. Huge numbers of women worked at Arlington Hall because it was considered the kind of detailed, meticulous, repetitive work that they were all so good at. And this was the same thing as at Bletchley Park as well. Many of the premier cryptanalysts at Bletchley Park did a lot of great work with pencil and paper trying to crack what in effect are incredibly complicated crossword puzzles. Well, here's the challenge for them. Five different cryptologic systems and a double encryption system in which you use a code book 
And then you take the results of that and you encipher them. So you're using codes and ciphers together. They're often mixed up in popular language, but they shouldn't be. Anyway, the point here is that the Soviets had several systems and they were using super security to try to protect them. But there is always a weakness in a cryptologic system. This is the way the British were able to break the Enigma machine and the way in which the people at Arlington Hall were able to break the Soviet machine. And this is how they were able to do it. First, very primitive IT technology, IBM card sorters. Remember those? Uh, I know some of you do. Many of you have never even heard of a punch card. But this is how it was done. The messages were rendered onto cards. Now, here's what the messages looked like. You had a code book in which important words were given numbers. And then the numbers were converted using a completely random set of other numbers. You had an addition process. So the result of it was a number that nobody could predict what would happen because they came off of those one-time pads I showed you in the previous slide. Completely randomly generated books of numbers that were never to be used again. And that supposedly created an impenetrable system. Well, the problem is that the Soviets, under the press of wartime exigencies, started to get a little bit sloppy, just like the Germans did with the Enigma sheet. It was noticed very early on, for example, by the British, that a lot of the messages sent by the Enigma machine all signed off with Heil Hitler. <laughs> and they all started to use kind of regularized language, like today is a sunny day, Heil Hitler, today is a rainy day, Heil Hitler. Well, the key to cryptology is repetition and mistakes. And enough of them cropped up periodically with the use of the one-time pad more than once, that with primitive at the time, to us, but at the time quite modern information sorting techniques, you could find these little errors. So that created what cryptologists call cribs, openings into the puzzle. This is kind of the equivalent if you're doing a crossword puzzle, you finally get that one letter and suddenly the whole system opens up and you solve the Sunday Post puzzle. Also, like the Germans, the Soviets came, became sloppy in using common language, the same terms appearing all the time repetitively. Again, that one weakness in the system. And also because of laxity and shortcuts, some of those five different systems started to use the same kind of encryption language. So all of these are precious mistakes for cryptologists. And this is how people at the Venona Project were able to break into it. Brilliant individuals like these made important accomplishments step by step. This is a long, tedious process. It took several years from the first time to the first break. Meredith Gardner is probably the key person because he was the one who broke a message showing that the Soviets had penetrated the atomic bomb project. It was he who read that one message that pointed out the names of prominent nuclear physicists working for us and also for the Soviets. Here's an example of one of those documents. Now, this is the NSA version, the National Security Agency printed version of the message. As this came into the cryptologists, it was nothing but batches of five numbers, row after row after row. So what these cryptologists had been able to do is recreate a code book they had never seen by using these little breaks in the system, working back, trial and error, puzzle, 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 pencil to paper, IBM card in the machine, and eventually they were able to recreate several thousand messages. This is just one example of many that have been published and declassified, and you see these on the NSA website. Here's a discussion of President Roosevelt being, being in pretty sorry shape. A more important example, however, is this one, which clearly indicates that the Rosenbergs are heavily involved in atomic espionage. You'll notice the code words that are used there at the bottom. Julius's code name was liberal. Uh, Gymnast was a member of the Young Communist League. Enormous was their code word for the Manhattan Project. So if you work your way through the message, you get, in effect, a clear indication that Julius Rosenberg and his enabler wife were up to their ears in atomic espionage. 
these were the first breaks into what turned out to be an immensely pervasive Soviet intelligence apparatus inside the US. Over 300 Americans and foreigners working in the United States have been identified through Venona as Soviet assets. They were either reporters, spies, collectors, agents of influence, people Lenin would call useful idiots, the whole gamut <laughs> of people working for the Soviets against the United States, some with malicious intent, some with naive idealism, some were in it just for the money. A huge range of examples, but here are some of the keys here, and we'll go around clock clockwise here from the upper left. Judith Copeland, working in the Justice Department, the first one nabbed through Venona, but she wiggled away because of technicalities at the trial. Klaus Fuchs, working for the British and for us, identified there. Ted Hall, probably the most brilliant and the most damaging of any of the spies, he got free. Harry Dexter White, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. On the lower right, Larry Duggan, Assistant Secretary of State and probable Vice President under a Henry Wallace administration. Had Vice President Wallace succeeded to the presidency with Franklin Roosevelt's death. Lachlan Curry, a White House advisor very close to Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes, Alger Hiss, guilty as charged, and the Rosenberg Ring. All of these people who were supposedly believed to be persecuted liberal innocents throughout the Cold War were actually up to their necks and beyond in Soviet espionage. Joe McCarthy was right. He just went after the wrong people and did it in a clumsy way. But there was a huge Soviet underground apparatus for decades in the United States working against us. And this is the accomplishment of the known by cracking those codes, working with the FBI to surveil, to monitor, because you couldn't use Venona just by itself. It's too confusing. No jury would convict on that. It was too precious to bring into court. So you have to find evidence of espionage in the act or get a confession. That's why so many of these people got away. Because once the Soviets realized that we were reading these messages, and that's thanks to two traitors who had access to them, they all went to ground. And as soon as some of their defectors, like Elizabeth Bentley, member of the Communist Party USA, talked about all of her dealings with the Soviet espionage apparatus, they closed everything down. So when the FBI went after these people with the Venona tips, they couldn't find them doing espionage, because they'd been told to hit, uh, hit cover. Then they learned, <coughs> courtesy of these two spies in 1949, that we had broken their cryptologic system. William Weissband worked at the Army Security Agency and was telling the Soviets everything about what Meredith Gardner and others were doing to break the codes. Harold Kim Philby here was the British MI6 there, CIA, liaison to Washington, and he is privy to all of this information and, and a whole lot more. He's passing it right to the Soviets. So by 1949-1950, this all goes dark and we're not listening into this anymore. The accomplishment is achieved. We were able to nab some of the spies, but that's pretty much the end of it. The connection I would make here with the next story is uh, James Angleton. He is a longtime Arlington resident and a longtime head of CIA counterintelligence. He ran our counterintelligence staff from 1954 to 74. He was one of the first agency officers read into the Venona Project. And to him, along with what he already knew about Soviet espionage, this was an epiphany. Because he realized right then how vulnerable the United States was and had been for many years to Soviet intelligence attack. Angleton lives, he lived here on uh, North 33rd Road. Some of you who saw what was a really sad film of him after he was dismissed, he's kind of ambushed by the, the press gang, literally, out on the lawn, he's, he's drunk, he'd been up for days, he was stressed, he was tubercular, and he gave an absolutely miserable farewell during that uh, film show. That, regrettably, is the only thing people remember about uh, Angleton in person, probably, because he kept himself pretty, pretty quiet. He was, as I say, the long-term head of counterintelligence and had a very powerful influence on American counterintelligence for good and bad. And I won't have time to go into the good parts because it's the bad parts that kind of run through the theme here. 
He was so concerned about Soviet intelligence attack against the United States because of what he knew from his historical studies, his casework in Venona, that he cultivated within the agency a powerful mystique about counterintelligence. He, in effect, created a service within a service with its own communications, its own file system, its own safes, its veto power against operations, exactly what he experienced working for the OSS counterpart during World War II. He grew up in counterintelligence in the greatest war ever, and he took those lessons into the Cold War and said, this is how we must operate against this even graver threat. He sums it up very well in this one quote here. Counterintelligence, in effect, is the essence of intelligence. Because if you can't run secure operations, it's worthless. You get nothing but bad reporting. All your covert actions will be broken up. You try to recruit somebody, they're actually being sent against you to be recruited. Or your own agents out in the field are being turned back against you. That's the lesson that he took through his career. And he even crafted a sort of a metaphor for this, a wilderness of mirrors, a very evocative image about a landscape of duplicity, of fantasy masquerading as, fic as fact and vice versa. You never know who you can trust. Aren't they really selling you a bill of goods? Well, of course, here's the historical evidence. Hundreds and hundreds of cases gone bad. Something seriously is amok in US intelligence. And this is how he envisioned how the Soviets were doing it against us. They're sending out this wave of bogus sources defectors, dangles, double agents. We're so desperate for information during the Cold War, we'll take anything we can get, and we're not too concerned about figuring out whether it's good or bad. We just want the information. And so we wind up taking all this bad info in. There's a mole on the inside of our organization that's telling his handlers, yep, they bought that one, that's a good story. Oh, they didn't quite go for that, let's fine tune that a little bit. And the cycle just continues. We did this during World War II. Angleton was there. He saw it could happen. He studied Soviet intelligence. He saw that they had an extensive espionage apparatus. And he also knew that they had done some very serious damage to Western intelligence. In the late 50s, early 60s, almost every important Western intelligence service had had a counterintelligence crisis of some point. From 1959 to 1963, there were dozens of cases of Soviet espionage disclosed throughout the West. Angleton, I think, rightly thinks, why are we so good? Well, we're not. We've already had some cases that went bad. We just haven't found that mole yet who's penetrated within and is disclosing all of our most sensitive operations. And of course, my buddy Kim Philby, because I was his liaison officer at CIA, he tricked me. I had no idea he was pulling the rug out from under us. So they must really be good if I'm so smart. And third, we don't know what we don't know. We have no sources inside Soviet intelligence. We're not listening into them anymore, thanks to Philby and Weissman. So we must presume penetration and go look for it. Why not? Because the record is clear. We can't be so good right now that they aren't after us. And this is what launches Angleton onto one of the most notorious escapades of the war, of the Cold War, the Mole And it's fed by distinctive viewpoints of Soviet espionage by two defectors who come out with a couple of years of each other. Galitsyn telling Angleton everything he wants to hear, and Nosenko telling him exactly the opposite. Well, they both can't be right. So immediately, Galitsyn is considered bona fide. Nosenko was branded as a defector who is sent out, hence proving the strategic deception operation. And on it goes. The mole hunt commences around 1964 and goes on for a number of years. It's a very serious problem for the agency because it creates operational disruption. When you have a whole division of your organization, several hundred people, who is suspect because many of them fit the profile the Litson has provided, after all, if you're targeting the Soviet Union and its empire, who are the kinds of agents you want to recruit? People like that. And who are the types of people you want to employ? People like that who know something about the target environment. So suddenly, within your own organization, you have potentially dozens and dozens and dozens of moles. So here you do the complicated counterintelligence walk back, putting the pieces together, who knew what, when, who was around when the case was compromised, and so forth. Huge spider web 
of connections is created. You hone in on a number of people. You find 40 possibles, about 14 definite suspects. And that's pretty much the end of their careers for a number of years because they can't get any near anything sensible. They're shelled, they're sidelined, pulled back from the field, dead end jobs, no promotions. It's a very difficult environment to work in. And we're not going after the, the prime target as much because we can't trust the operations we're running against us. That makes common sense. Well, there was a mole. Some people on the outside will say we never caught a mole. We did. But for Angleton, the problem was this wasn't the high level sensitive penetration he thought. This person didn't even work at the agency anymore. He'd been fired for incompetence. We now know what he was very confident at, blowing cases. That's why he was thrown out. He just didn't know he was the mole. Either. So Angleton persists with a mole hunt, and it goes on for a number of years without ever finding that particular individual. Eventually, Angleton's career comes to a crashing halt because of, no surprise, a leak. Seymour Hirsch, uh, industrious, indefatigable in Seymour Hirsch of the New York Times, uncovers, courtesy of some leak, we don't, still don't know where, could have been Congress, could have been CIA, could have been the executive branch, that the counterintelligence staff under James Angleton had been involved in two operations that were incredibly controversial for the time. Remember, this is when U.S. government reputation, the CIA reputation, are going down the tubes in the late 60s, early 70s, Vietnam, uh, everything like that. So when this news breaks that the CIA had been spying on Americans, members of the anti-war movement, <coughs> intercepting their mail, reading their messages, kind of sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? This is a scandal for the agency. Now, the bad thing for Angleton is, though he was up to his ears in the mail opening operation because he thought it was useful counterintelligence, he had nothing to do with the domestic espionage operation, which, one, has been way overblown in the press. There was nothing huge about the activity. But second, he was only very peripherally involved with it. Well, too bad. He's fired on the spot after 20 years of counterintelligence service and an additional 10 years working in the uh, OSS and the early CIA. Along with him, are dispatched three other counterintelligence professionals. A total of 120 years of counterintelligence experience is lost within a one month period. And what you find is, I believe, a serious overreaction to what went on. There was a precipitous move away from anything that Angleton had done. The counterintelligence staff itself, which was a fairly robust enterprise, was decimated. Nobody wanted to go there. It's a bad place to be. All it attracts is dead wood and hard uh, to fit in uh, actors and, and problem people. The head of it is never going to be a counterintelligence professional again. Get that. When you don't know anything about the organization, well, go run it. Uh, that becomes the watchman. And very quickly, an anti Angleton orthodoxy emerges inside the agency, under which if he did it, we're going to run in the other direction. And it's no accident, to my mind, that within a decade after that, six CIA officers say, hey, I can get away with it and make some quick money on the side because there's no Angleton's around, security is lax because we don't do witch hunts, we don't do mole hunts anymore. And later, we will find uh, serious problems here with the next case that we'll look at, which is that of Aldrich Ames. This is the rogues gallery of the agency. We actually have 14 uh, bad guys, uh, and we're gonna focus now on Aldrich Ames, whose connection is related to the anti Angleton orthodoxy, because he got away with his treachery for so long because the agency refused to look for him, because they weren't going to run another mole hunt. Aldrich Ames is the most destructive spy the CIA has ever had. He's not the most destructive spy U.S. intelligence has ever had. I would probably say that's uh, Robert Hansen of the FBI, I don't consider Edward Snowden a spy, but he is immensely damaging. I'll say right now during the Q&A period, don't ask me about Snowden, because I can't say anything about him. It's, it's off limits for me, seriously. I can talk about Ames, though, because he's convicted, everything's on the public record. There's still a fair amount of his case that's classified, but I can tell you quite a bit about him. He did it for the money. He was a greedy guy, he was in trouble, he uh, had a divorce settlement to pay off, he married uh, a really money-hungry, high-living wannabe wife named Rosario, 
Uh, I always bring this along because it's pretty astounding and I always want to get the numbers right. This is what they found in Rosario's house, which, by the way, Ames bought with $540,000 of cash. That's over $800,000 in today's money. Along with a $50,000 Jaguar, $100,000 of home remodeling, monthly phone bills exceeding $6,000, premium credit cards whose minimum monthly payment exceeded his monthly salary, and for Rosario, 60 purses, 500 pairs of shoes, and 165 unopened boxes of pantyhose. <laughs> it takes a lot of spying to keep up with someone like that. Well, we laugh, but it, it's tragic. The victims, uh, Rosario and Ames' home, 2512 uh, North Randolph, the one that they really bought with $540,000 of cash, and the people who paid the price are 10 of our assets executed after they were turned in by Ames within the first year of its treachery. 10 others were completely sidelined as operational assets. Their careers ruined because they fell under suspicion. Uh, this is a, uh, just five of the ones. Dmitry Plyakov on the upper left. Brigadier General in Soviet military intelligence, one of our best spies ever, originally figured by Hansen, then it's corroborated by Ames. Adolf Tolkachev, a member of a Soviet avionics and a uh, defense research institute, whose intelligence over an eight-year period saved the U.S. government billions of dollars in building things it didn't need, or did not building things it didn't need, and building the right things that it really did need. Uh, two, KGB operations officers who were turned in, and Oleg Gorbachevsky, thankfully, was able to escape through a very intricate infiltration operation uh, <coughs> conducted by the British. But the, the roll call here is very, very serious. In addition to all the assets Ames turned in, he also became a disinformation conduit because he was claiming to be collecting intelligence against the, the Soviets. It was all, a lot of it was bogus. Some of it has to be good to backstop his story. And then the agents whom the Soviets identified inside Russia were turned back against us and became disinformation channels for years. A lot of the reporting that we were getting from high-ranking Soviet sources was actually controlled information for many years and all had to be recalled. Now, justice was able to finally prevail right outside of Ames' home when he was called out on a pretext. He was about to leave the country. Uh, on a so-called TDY, temporary duty overseas trip for the agency, the suspicion by this time was that he was going to defect. So a contrived uh, scenario is arranged whereby he's going to go with his boss down to Washington to meet some counterparts in other agencies uh, on a kind of a cr crash project on Washington's birthday, and he's able, uh, gotten out of his house and he walks into this FBI ambush. But this is 1994, and he started his treachery in 1985. What went wrong? The problem is that we weren't looking for people like this because we didn't want to, because we weren't going to do what Angleton did. And Angleton did what Angleton did because of all the things he knew the Soviets had done against us. So that whole thread leading through these three stories comes back to a faithful ironic end by the fact that we simply aren't doing our jobs. There had to be some other reason why those 10 assets were killed and 10 others were rolled up. There was another de uh, de agency defector in 1985 named Edward Lee Howard. He knew about some of those cases, but not all of them. But that was sufficient for a lot of people. There were Marine guards at the embassy in Moscow who were letting the cleaning crew in to rummage around waste baskets and steal typewriter ribbons and looking for papers on their desks and things like that. Oh, that explains a few others. And then things we don't really know. Uh, maybe it was bad street craft, so our agents are being surveilled, and they walk into ambushes, and they're turned back against us. Maybe the Soviets had made a communications break into our uh, COVCOM, our covert communications, just as we had done with Venona. All sorts of things. Look for any other explanation except the most obvious, that maybe one or two people turned over all of these cases. Well, you can't do that, because that's what Angleton did. 
And so the case goes on for a number of years. The FBI and the agency are not cooperating. They're running separate investigations for a while, stepping on each other's toes, not sharing information, distrust mounts. The people assigned to investigate the case inside the agency are not given adequate resources. They're understaffed. Some of them are pulled off of the assignment temporarily and not replaced. It just rambles on and on for several years. It finally focuses in the early 1990s because one individual on this small group investigating the Ames case suddenly finds out about all that high living that Rick Ames had been doing with no apparent explanation for the income that was persuasive. He always said, well, Rosario's rich and one of the relatives died and inherited a Brazilian dollars, so of course uh, we bought the house with cash, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that didn't quite add up to this one intuitive individual. And then another person on the team noticed something that was Rick Ames' fateful mistake. Every time he met with his Soviet handler in Washington, one or two days later, he made a large deposit in a bank account. And this went on for a number of years. By this time, we had gotten authority to investigate individuals' financial transactions. We couldn't do that before the early 1990s. And this investigation led to that clear smoking gun, if you will, for Ames. The FBI is called in. It's a sufficient case for them. They start a big investigation, surveillance, monitoring. They break into his house, get into his computer, and uh, find, go through his trash. They, even, they developed this intricate scenario whereby you would put the trash out, they would come in with a fake trash truck, take it out, look through it, redeposit it, go away. And so what they found in one bag was a torn up post-it note that indicated that he was to have a meeting at a certain uh, signal site to lay down a dead drop mark and indicate that something was filled and so forth. So in, in other words, he had left a tradecraft clue. And that was enough for them. So they put all the pieces together and ambush him here in 1994. Now, what is the outcome of all of this? I think it's a, a little bit of a dubious enterprise here. In part because of all of the intelligence scandals of the 1985 period, the so-called Year of the Spy, the Counterintelligence Center is established with a joint CIA-FBI staffing. But it is not really focused as well as it should be on cases like this because they're not looking for moles. They're looking for the alternative explanations. As we say here, reflexive search for other uh, explanations. Well, thankfully, after Ames is rolled up, people kind of learned a few lessons for good and for bad. One of them was that the FBI and CIA needed to cooperate more in subsequent investigations. That's good. What's bad is this guy. Harold Nicholson, the highest ranking CIA officer ever arrested for espionage, GS-15, a colonel captain equivalent in the military, he starts spying after Ames is caught. And that might strike you as odd, but it really shouldn't, because he knew how botched the Ames investigation had been, and he figures, hey, I'm smart enough to get away with it, so I'll go spy. They'll never catch me. Well, unbeknownst to him, some of the procedures laid in after the Ames investigation worked, and they caught him fairly quickly, and the damage was relatively limited. However, all through this period of time, going back to 1980, the FBI is committing the same blunders that we were starting in roughly 1985 with the Ames case. And you could probably go back a few years before if you look at some of our CI investigations then. Robert Hansen started spying for the Soviets and then shifted over to the Russians after the end of the Cold War in 1980. And he's not caught until 2001. The single most devastating spy, I would argue, and many would agree with me, in US history. Not just a bunch of assets working for one agency, and Ames did also turn in some bureau agents, but Hansen turned in theirs, ours, lots of stuff related to technical collection, signals intelligence, continuity of government plans, infrastructure, you name it, he had access to it. He gave it away for about two plus million dollars. By the way, Ames got 4.6 million for his treasure. 
The FBI is resistant to the idea, even though they had a couple of bad apples already, to looking for a spy in their midst with Hansen. They are trying to finger somebody else. And indeed, they invest a lot of effort trying to implicate one of the agency's own people, erroneously, who he spends three years of, with his life and his family's lives ruined. His name is Brian Kelly, recently deceased. It's a tragic story of investigatory ardor gone awry because the Bureau was doing what we were doing with the Ames case. Has to be some other explanation. So what I would suggest is that we have a basic problem with counterintelligence, and I'll, and I'll close with this. And it really falls back on a couple, on several insoluble dilemmas related to counterintelligence, which for my two decades of studies of agency history, I would suggest is the most difficult enterprise in intelligence. One problem is that you can't imagine if you're running the CIA or any intelligence organization a worse situation than having one of your own people telling all the secrets to the enemy. As Richard Helms once said, that's a nightmare that I live with every day. Richard Helms, one of our former directors. The problem, though, is that it may be a nightmare, but it's not a dream. It is a reality. And here's something I want to emphasize for you. Paul Redman, one of our most important counterintelligence officers ever, has said there is an actuarial certainty that there are other spies in US intelligence, and there always will be. And I'm telling you right now, with no insider knowledge, that several, if not more, people in US intelligence, as I'm speaking, are working for the enemy. If you take every case, whether it's classified or unclassified, and I'm not telling any secrets here, if you line up the timelines of all of those agents lives working against us, you will find no gap in all of those timelines. It is just a solid set of lines going back into the 1930s and running, I would say, to the present. The problem for counterintelligence people is confronting that. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. William Webster, former DCI, once observed, if you're catching spies, you have a bad counterintelligence service. When you're not catching spies, you also have a bad intelligence service. How can you have it both ways? If you catch one, do you get plaudits for good investigatory work, tight security? No. How'd they get in the door? How'd they stay so long? Why didn't you notice them sooner? Who flubbed up? Well, you need more counterintelligence awareness and better security practices. If you don't catch spies, it's not because everybody's being properly vetted, everybody's honest, it's you're not looking in the right places. Do your job. This is why counterintelligence is a stress test for an intelligence officer. It really is the toughest way to go. Final point, we are never going to get this right. I don't mean to end on a down note, but I think this is a reality because good counterintelligence is, if you will, anti-American. Robert Gates says it best, former DCI. In any democratic society, counterintelligence is decidedly difficult and will never be perfect. It wasn't perfect even in the totalitarian Soviet Union, and it certainly won't be in America. People don't like snoops. They don't like surveillance. They don't like snitches. They don't like being investigated. They may like to do it to other people, but don't come near me. And notice how the pendulum changes. You've all been through this in your various lives. There are many different age ranges around here. You've seen it happen. And most recently, think of the difference between 2001 and 2013. Uh, you've moved in a radically different direction over that dozen years or so. And the problem is kind of fitting it in with the civic culture of America. Our political ethic simply does not allow for strong counterintelligence. So we have to work from inside the various agencies to change the culture, which is a nice buzzword, and nobody ever does it. We try to be aware of other people's problems uh, without being a snitch. You don't 
want to report them because then they won't like you and all of this. And you can just see how this is going. This is why we never, really never, ever get it right. And that's kind of the underlying theme of all these stories. We didn't get it right when we let the Soviets back into the country. We found out about it. Then we went after them, went too far, went too far in the other direction, and then went back there. And who knows what crisis, whether it's a terrorist attack, a counterintelligence disaster, whatever it is, is going to send us running in the other direction too far, and then we're just going to have to, as is often said, recalibrate and try to find that good middle ground. Thank you very much. So real quick, this is your favorite part of the night, and I do apologize. Time check. We do have to be out of here by 9 p.m. Mm. So we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. So please uh, stand up, make your questions succinct, we don't have mics tonight, so I need your voices to carry, and we will repeat the question before it's answered. Thank you. I would like to know, in your opinion, what spy is, has been the most Okay, the, the individual spy, I would suggest, is, is Robert Hansen, the, the FBI turncoat, uh, for reasons previously mentioned. Um, as I say, I, I don't want to get into the Snowden case. It's uh, a different matter because of the nature of the information he had access to. It, it's all signals intelligence information, but it may have some longer range impacts on our diplomatic relations with other countries, our operational capabilities against terror groups, uh, and so forth. But if you will, pound for pound, the single spy who disclosed the most would be Robert Hansen. Some people would say maybe John Walker and the Walker Ring operating inside the U.S. Navy from 1969 to 1985 may have, if you will, the highest body count because the Walker Ring turned over cryptographic information to our adversaries, the Soviets, who certainly shared it with the North Vietnamese, and undoubtedly some of that information that enabled the North Vietnamese to monitor U.S. aircraft missions into the North during the war cost dozens and dozens, maybe even more, uh, pilots uh, and crew their lives because the service to air missiles and the anti-aircraft guns were waiting for them because Walker had tipped them off to the missions indirectly because they were reading the naval communications. I'd say probably those two, Hanson and Walker. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom What, what is it? They, the question is, why was all of Ames's income not noticed? Because he put it into multiple bank accounts and small sums, so it would never trigger a reporting requirement. And the only way he was, we were tipped off to him was, as I said, when we were able to get access in the early 1990s to employees' financial transactions. And there we saw not so much individual transactions in large amounts, but rather the pattern of small transactions related to his dates of meeting with the Soviet handler. Now see, Ames was allowed to meet with Soviets because that was his job. When he worked in the Soviet division, he was supposed to go out and try to pitch Soviet diplomats in the Washington area. So when he would go to lunch with a known KGB officer, at Chadwick's restaurant in Alexandria, that was operationally uh, okay. Well, actually, he's passing documents and picking up an envelope of money, all under the ruse of him doing operational activity for us. So he had a, he had a perfect cover uh, for action as he was in color. Wayne Baxter. I don't have a question. I would like to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you very much. Sir, I'm going to put you on the executive.
this is a polygraph as a screening tool? Okay. Well, I've beat it a number of times. <laughs> I would say that it is more a useful deterrent than it is for uncovering something. It's routinely used as a way of making sure that officers are doing what they're supposed to do, haven't done what they shouldn't do. It's routinely used for vetting assets in the field when somebody comes to you and offers their services or you identify them and try to pitch them, you polygraph them. The idea that you will be polygraphed often is a deterrent to doing something or trying to run yourself against us. I think his value is more than that. As you know, it's not legally admissible as evidence, uh, but we, we do find it historically to be a good way of, of keeping people honest. There. How do you um, define the sharing of intelligence between the U.S. and Israel when Israel spies so heavily on many countries, including the U.S., and how do you characterize the damage that Jonathan Pollard did to the U.S.? Right. Yeah, the, the question about Pollard is apropos because he's constantly trying to uh, get clemency, and periodically U.S. presidents are given this case as something that they have to deal with. Uh, most recently became an issue in the Clinton administration, and George Tenet, the director of Central Intelligence at the time, told Bill Clinton that if you pardon Jonathan Pollard, I'm resigning. Uh, good for George on that one. It's a, a watchword in the intelligence business that there are no friendly services. There are just services with common interests and common enemies. And Israel is a good example of that. We have very close relations with the Commonwealth services, as we call them, the British and the, the, the big Commonwealth countries, and a long-standing agreement that we will not spy against each other. That does not hold, however, with other collectives of our liaison partners. Uh, we have something with the, the Commonwealth countries called the Five Eyes. There's also a G9, there's a G14, and a G21. This has nothing to do with the international uh, economic groups. This is liaison plus kinds of relationships. And Israel doesn't fall in any of those groups. Uh, we have just a long-standing shared uh, intelligence relationship with them because, one, we were committed to the uh, existence of Israel as a, as a free state. And two, they were very useful intelligence partners for us to get information about the Soviet Union. Interesting you raise that because James Angleton was a powerful supporter of Israel as a nation. And he had charge of the Israeli account. The CIA intelligence account dealing with Israel, the relationship with Mossad and, and other organizations there, was handled not by our Near East division, where bureaucratically you think it would belong, but in Angleton's show, because one, it was so sensitive, so valuable for Russian intelligence, and he was committed to Israel's existence. He was a committed Zionist because he developed relationships with the diaspora leaders in Europe during World War II when he was stationed in Italy uh, with OSS. He brought that into the Cold War, trafficked in it, became a very valuable source of intelligence for him. But they are in it, they have their fundamental interests as well. There's no country in the world like Israel when you think about it being surrounded by hostile powers and with its commitment to independence and its own existence. And that explains their uh, realistic conception of what liaison is. Jonathan Pollard was quite damaging. He's always tried to minimize uh, his impact, but he provided huge amounts of information um, Dozens of cubic feet of documents he squirreled out of the Office of Naval Intelligence over a number of years. Uh, an enormous amount, just very bad security. Uh, getting into stuff he had no business looking at, nobody monitoring his movements, uh, and so forth. And it was uh, a lot of stuff. Many of the details are still classified. You can read about it in a, in a number of books. Will Blitzer's book on, on the Pollard case is a good one. There's another one by, um, I can't remember recently, a guy named Winter, uh, I think is his name. 
Uh, he was one of the investigators of, of Pollard. Uh, very serious case. One of the year of the spy cases. Um, think about this. 1985, the worst single year for counterintelligence disaster in the U.S. 14 spies identified within the space of a little more than a year, but it makes good journalism. You just call it a year of spy. What we didn't know is that 30 other spies were working against us in 1985, including Alder James, but also Robert Hansen, Anna Montez, Clyde Lee Conrad, Jeff Carney, James T. Hall, uh, I miss one, Kendall Myers, uh, and his wife of the State Party. A huge number of cases, 30, which just goes back to my point. We might have done good counterintelligence in uncovering those 12 to 14. We did rotten counterintelligence <laughs> in missing those other 30 who did devastating damage for years and years. We still need to get it right. Quick one here. This is not a Snowden question. But as we become more and more dependent upon uh, technology, and as we contract out and hire contractors to do the technology, and as admin officers or these contractors end up having more access than anyone else, who are you looking for? The, um, the digitalization of intelligence is very much a, I don't like to use trite phrases, but a double-edged sword. What it enables people to do, this is one of these, what I call trends in treason over the, the past couple of decades. There, there are several of them. We won't have time to get into them, but this is an important one. Digitalization allows first-time spies to do more damage right up front, but it enables them to get caught quicker because of the technology security that's built in, one hopes anyway. Um, and so that, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so what you want to do is watch them up front because you're pretty good at the other side, uh, just because of audit trails and, and that kind of stuff. It's not, I'm not saying it's a firewall by any stretch, but it's a lot better than trying to figure out who took that file. And who was on that photocopy machine uh, six months ago, I think, is that maybe that's the way it got out. I have no idea. Maybe somebody just took the original. That, that kind of dog work of counterintelligence that was a traditional kind of gumshoe CI investigation. Now, with digitalization, you run the risk of more up front, you know, Bradley Manning, Snowden, and all that, but you'll catch them quicker because the, it gets picked up at, at some point in the, in, in the training. Well, let's give a thank you so much.